Welcome, I'm Tommy Master and this is another Data36 live webinar where I will talk about my personal experience with data science job interviews because in the last five, six months I applied to a few data science positions and I will share my experience about it. And also note that, and I guess all of you who are in this stream, you know this already, but after this webinar, at 10 p.m. Central European time, I will launch the Junior Data Scientist First Month course, which is a six-week simulation of being a junior data scientist at a true-to-life startup. So it's a super practical, I think it's the most practical data science online course out there. You will use SQL, you will use Python, and you will use it on a real-life server. So it's, it's very exciting. It, there are a lot of real-life like problems in it, so I, I think it's the perfect practicing. Also, it comes with a few extras, which I will uh, partially mention, but they are already listed on the landing page. So if you want to enroll, data36.com slash JDS, that's the website that you should visit. But let's start with today's topic, my personal experience with data science job interviews. Um, so I've done this in the last few months, partially because I wanted to have an updated experience about how a data science job interview looks like because in the last five years I've worked on Data36 which means that I uh, teach data science and I have freelancing projects and I do client works but I haven't really applied to uh, data science positions, full-time positions and I was curious if I could still get one and how hard it is and how the interview process changed since my last full-time position, which was like five years ago. I quit in 2017. And partially I've done this because I wanted to share this experience, the learnings and the insights with you guys. So I hope that you will like it. Uh, a few disclaimers. I applied for senior positions. so. This will be somewhat different from, uh, from a junior position, but the key takeaways that I listed in this presentation, I think they will be the same. The second thing is that I won't show you exact interview questions because I wouldn't find it ethical to leak out questions. I will show you the general process and takeaways and learnings, but I won't show you exact questions. Um, but if you want to see interview questions, you just go to uh, glassdoor.com, Reddit forums, or you just Google them, the company you will apply for, and uh, data science interview questions, and you will find a lot of questions. So today I won't show you um, exact questions. I will give you a more like a high level um, knowledge about the whole interview process. Uh, so, as I said, I've done this partly to figure out uh, whether I'm good enough to get a position, but also, and I recommend to have this mindset for you as well, also because I wanted to practice. Partially fun, but, uh, you know, if you want to get a job, probably you won't get it for your first try, but, and this goes for practicing anything, but, particularly for job interviews, I think it's really important that first you try to get a job, you send in your CV, they uh, refuse you, but you get feedback. What was wrong with your CV? What you have to learn? Then you try to improve yourself or simply just your CV. Then you try again. You uh, This time you get an interview round, but you fail that interview round. Again, you have to ask feedback, learn from it, improve it. Uh, I have a missed arrow here, but you get the point. So the point is that try feedback, improve, and you shall practice job interviews. So anyway, if you see yourself, like you, you, if you already have the skills and you see yourself applying for data science positions like three months from now, uh, but you know, for some reason you don't want to do that right now, I still think that you at least have to test the process with, let's say, with a company that you don't want to work for, 
just you know you just apply you try out yourself you gather some feedback and when you get there in three months or six months you already will have some experience and it will be more in your comfort zone when you apply to a uh, data science uh, position for a company you really want to work for and this is important because i see that people you know they expect that they will get their uh, the data science position that they first apply for and usually it doesn't happen and it's you know it's it's really it's a it's a bad feeling when you are refused and especially if you are applying for a company that you really want to work for so anyway you get my point you have to practice you have to iterate and you have to improve yourself to nail a job interview after uh all. Okay, so these were my disclaimers, and I will show you the process. Luckily, the process didn't change in the last five years, so I pretty much had the same interview rounds with a few tweaks uh, in 2017 than I had right now, and the runs look like this. First, of course, it's the CV round, or if you are lucky enough, you get an outreach from an HR person on LinkedIn it's the same thing, you start the process. Then you will have an HR interview. It's almost always the next step after the CV round. Um, you will have like a certain discussion with an HR folk and you will get asked, uh, I will talk more about this soon. So anyway, the second round is the HR interview. Then you will have a coding interview. It's mostly automated nowadays. So back in the days when I applied in 2017 to a few companies, I did whiteboard interviews with uh, data scientists on site or online, but it wasn't automated. There was a person sitting in front of me. Nowadays, it's almost fully automated, which is fine. Um, then you will probably get a take-home assignment, then you will have your tech uh, slash analytics interview, most probably about your take-home assignment, but just in general, they want to see how do you think about analytics and just in general what uh, tools you use, how effectively can you use them. Then you will have a PM interview, project manager or product manager interview, so someone uh, you will talk to someone who's a non-technical person, but who will work uh, closely with on the job. And after uh, all these six steps, you will probably have a salary negotiation. The process can be shorter for juniors. So for seniors, I think it's a bit more steps. That's why I had seven steps in my processes. And from company to company, the order can change or they can add an extra interview or remove an interview but this is the general process that i have seen most of the times uh, in in this webinar by the way i don't just add my experience but uh, the jds course participants experience who were kind enough to share with me so i will include a few insights from them so um, i will talk about that as well Anyway, here is the, well, not the most exciting part, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting, my stats. So how did I do? So I sent in 10 CVs, I got three HR interviews, so there was a big churn right at the first step, I will talk about that. For, I nailed all, all, the, all the HR interviews, luckily, then I got th three coding screening, which I failed one, where I failed one, so... I got two take-home assignments, two analytics interviews, so luckily I was good enough with the take-home assignments, two PM interviews, where I failed again on one interview and after all, one offer. And I show you these numbers because, the, as you can see, there are, out of 10, I got only one offer, so it means that somewhere at the process, sometimes at the very end of the process you get a refusal and that hurts it hurts in the at the cv round as well uh, but it hurts uh, anywhere because you know it's it's just uh, it's just a bad feeling when they say to you that you are not enough and i felt it even though i 
didn't actually want to get those jobs, I still felt bad enough after they refused me. But this is the game that we are playing here, so <laughs> you just get to get stronger emotionally and see that these are the general numbers. So sometimes, you know, even from 100 CV cents, you get only 5, 6 or 10 HR interviews, that's fine as well. It, it really depends. Although you can probably, if you have those numbers, you can a little bit uh, update your CV. I will talk about that as well. But the general idea is that um, that you get only a very few offers um, when you send in a lot of applications. So my great friend, uh, he's Hungarian, so I... I cannot refer to his website meaningfully on this international platform, but uh, he's called a CV shark. So he, this guy is a career coach and he says that volume is everything. So if you want to get your job, you have to send in a lot of CVs. And he, he, he says that he sees the same numbers. Um, I got one of my junior uh, data scientist first months uh, participants said that he sent in five or six CVs and got one offer. He was a, first of all, he was very talented and he had a strong CV already, but he was lucky as well. So that's, but anyway, these, these are the numbers. So if you don't get your first offer from your first CV send in, um, don't feel too bad. It's, it's part of the game. Uh, fun fact, I had zero on-site interviews, which means that everything was online which is in 2022, it's quite <laughs> acceptable. And since I applied for uh, jobs that are not in my home country, I really appreciated it that I haven't had to fly uh, on site. When I had my interview in 2017, I had to fly to Sweden from Hungary just for a few interviews. So uh, th this was much nicer. So I will start with the CV round or the LinkedIn round, if you are lucky. Uh, as you see, I had a quite big churn, so many refusers uh, at the CV round. I sent in 10 CVs and I got only three HR interviews. And actually, I got only uh, two uh, feedbacks from email feedbacks from those companies, automated feedbacks, by the way, who refused me so five companies didn't bother to reply which wasn't really nice but i guess this is how it is uh but yeah i i got three hr runs uh so 30 percent was my conversion rate at the first step and my cv wasn't that good but i think what was good in it that it was very simple it was only one page and very focused. So I, since I had a lot of data related experience, I just had to list out those experiences. But if you have not as much data uh, science related experience, you can still like fill half of the page with uh, data related experiences like courses you took, side projects or hobby projects you did, um, projects that are somewhat somewhat related to data science or real life positions where let's say you were a marketer but you had to analyze things during uh, during the process and y you can still add those you can list your skills so the point is that if it's simple enough and if you list m more data related and less data unrelated things that's a good thing but you know this this my my cv was nothing special you can by the way download this uh, cv sample from data36.com uh, my linkedin is the same i try to keep it simple um, nothing special a few things that i would update right now on my cv is that i would try to make it stand out more uh, just a thought about standing out you everyone who got hired uh from the juniors that i talked to uh, from my course uh they said that 
at some point at the interview process the the interviewer confirmed that they stand that that they stood out somehow and most of the times these were like hobby projects on their CVs so that's the easiest way to stand out because if you mm, got 10 CVs where there are few positions few data science courses but nothing else then you have an interesting hobby project or an interesting side project on the CV then you will be more curious about that applicant and then you will read through the CV and you will favor that uh, CV but uh, so just try to stand out somehow but an easy way to stand out is simple CV design and I've learned this from the CV shark career coach guy as well so he said that my CV is not bad but not good as well um, yeah like not great not terrible uh, he said that an easy thing would be is to add a headline to it like my uh, greatest unique selling point like how can I sell myself of course for me it was that I have a lot of experience so instead of saying Tommy Master data scientist slash analyst and then listing my experience I say that Tommy Master data scientist with 10 years of experience and that really stands out that's the first few lines that people read it will be more interesting that's sort of the hook for my CV like on a marketing website and you can think about your CV similarly of course if you don't have 10 years experience as a junior you probably won't have it and that's fine because you are competing people who still don't have it um, if you have a related um, bachelor degree or master's degree you can add it there so it will validate you instantly or if you have done uh, something uh, something very close to data science like marketing you can say um, marketer with strong data science focus or data scientist with a marketing background especially if the company that you are applying for is a marketing company or it's if it's a fintech company you can say data scientist with a fintech background if you are otherwise coming from the fintech scene uh, you get the point you you had the headline that highlights your greatest um, selling point and your your greatest uh, feature so to say and probably it should contain the data scientist word somewhere because you are applying for a data position also it's like he said that it's okay if I list my experience from data 36 but don't start with I create data science courses because it's never relevant to the company start with because I started with I said that I create hands-on coding heavy data science courses for aspiring data scientists uh, I also added a link I don't know why and I then on the second point I said that I work on client projects with a special focus on SAS company the correlation analysis blah 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 and he said that I should just change this and that would have a very good effect on the perception of my CV because this will be the first line that the HR person will probably read especially important that I add Python SQL and machine learning methods because that's what they are looking for and this I create a course it's it's more like a nice to have so I don't have to highlight that I can even erase that from the CV a few words about LinkedIn there is a thing called uh, LinkedIn SEO search engine optimization so you can actually fine-tune your LinkedIn bio that you pop up in relevant searches for HR people you have to listen to the right keywords I'm not a big LinkedIn SEO person so I don't know a lot about this but I'm pretty sure there are like a lot of courses about that online um, you go and check one if you are interested but what really helps me because I, I just checked this a few days ago that I got like in the last 90 days I got 1000 views on my profile and I'm not a big LinkedIn guy so I 
the only thing I do that I sometimes I post my things that if I have a thought about data science or if I just want to promote something on LinkedIn, I I just post them. So every week, once a week, I post some things that I think that it's useful for people on LinkedIn or related or just want, I want to say it and I, I think it's interesting. I post it there and it already brings me like 1000 views in the last 90 days. Some of these people are HR people. So uh, actually I got reach out. Out of those 10 applications, one of the applications were uh, from LinkedIn reach out. So they reached out to me and that's a very good position to be in. Red flags. So if you get a no reply email to your CV send in saying that thanks for applying, your application has been received, but we are not sure we can reply. Also, this is a no reply email address, so don't reply this email. That's a huge red flag. Yeah, so I, I, I don't really like these replies. The next round is the HR round. So if you pass the CV round, again, at the CV round, you should if you, if you don't get feedback, you should send an email at least even to no reply email addresses. You just can have a, a standard email for that and ask f for feedback. You can push to ask for feedback. How should you apply? Uh, how should you update your CV? How um, what else you should learn? Uh, so it's not just a CV design thing. It can actually uh, new knowledge that you can gather. Okay. Next round, the HR round. So I was lucky enough and I think I did very well on the HR rounds because I passed all three HR rounds. And here are a few tips that worked for me. So first of all, I will always try to be friendly but professional. This should go without saying um, the professional part, sure. You, you should be friendly as well, so a smile always helps. A typical question that you might get and you want to have a clear answer for is that why do you want to change? Why do you want to change your career? Why do you choose this particular company? Why do you want to change, move from the company that you are working for? And you should have a good answer for this. Uh, the answers are always different, but... Um, the point is that you should have prepared to this. The other thing is, and for me, this was a very important thing uh, to prepare for, that I knew that if I apply for jobs, they will ask me uh, about Data36. Like it's a, it's a company or a freelancing business that I run for myself. Why do I want to move away from it? And I admit that I a little bit light here, but it was for the for for a good reason <laughs> because you know I want to work for myself still, and I really enjoy data thirty six working uh, as a freelancer at data thirty six. I enjoy doing the courses, but what I said, and again, this was a questionable point on on my CV. I knew that they will ask for about it, so I had a clear answer. I said that I want more stability. I have two kids now. I just want to make sure that uh, there are no risky faces in my life. And that wasn't true because I I like risk a little bit and adventure and that's why I'm doing Data36 and, and freelancing. But the point is that if you have something on your CV that, that could be a negative thing, they will ask you about it and you will have to have a good answer for that. I say sorry for HR people who uh, interviewed me if they are listening to this. Uh, move on. The next thing is that you should prepare with two, three questions yourself because at the end of the session, they will ask you whether you have questions and you, it shows that you are more motivated if you at least have two, three questions. It's good if you have by yourself, but if you don't, you can ask about the team. How is the team? How is it work for for that given company or you can ask about the stack like what do they use what do they run their python scripts on what do they run the sql scripts on uh, so just they see that you care um, at this point i think it's best not talking about the salary 
uh, and neither salary expectations. Sometimes they ask for your salary expectation, but I think that at this point you somehow have to uh, pass on that question. You, you, if they don't ask about it, sometimes they are nice enough to talk about the salary ranges and uh, the benefits and everything else. That's fine. You say, okay, thank you, noted. We will talk about that. That's, that's great. But if they ask you proactively about your salary expectations, I think that somehow it's the best if at this point you say that you don't want to talk about it right now or you have to check with your friends, especially if you are moving to another country. You know, you just don't want to talk about salary right now because it can impact the rest of the interview. Also, it can you can you can end up with lower salaries then you would go, you could negotiate at the end of the interview so there was a situation when when they really pushed for my salary i shouldn't have, have answered i think but I, I did and i really 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 felt like screwed at that point uh, so next time when they ask about your about my salary and if they are really pushy about it i say that it's a it's a company secret for the company that i work for i signed an nda i can't talk about my salary that's it they can say anything to that um the coding round, that's the third round, right? So you pass the CV round, you pass the EHR round. Here comes the first technical point, uh, technical round, the round where you have to prove that you can actually do the job. Um, the coding round. My, my stats, I failed one coding, automated co coding interview, and I felt really bad about it. Um, I will talk about that, but uh, how this work? It's really simple. There are a lot of cool websites that do this automated interview process. It's this one that you see here. It's HackerRank.com. It's a. It's. I think it's the most famous one. But there are tons of similar websites like this. Um, I went through at least four or five of different platforms of these um, in the last two three years just just to check out them. All of them work the same way. Uh, you get a task, like a very well-described task, task usually that you see on the left side. Uh, you will have to write code for it. They will tell you before the interview whether you have to write SQL code or Python code or something else. It will prob If you are applying for a junior data science position, probably it will be SQL, I think, because they just want to check whether you are you know, good, good enough with the basics. And you will probably have simple tasks, but because of the time limits, uh, this can be still very stressful. So that, that's what happened to me. So first I got, uh, I applied to a company. That was my first automated coding interview. I was okay. I teach Python, I teach SQL, show me anything, I will solve it. And I failed because I haven't practiced, I got nervous. Uh, I didn't know the platform, I didn't know how it worked. And I ran out of time, I got confused by, by a task that wasn't described the simplest way because they want to test obviously that as well, that you can understand even complex uh, tasks as well. And I failed. So after that, first of all, for every this every of these sites, there is a sample test where you can. This is only one test where you can explore the platform, how it works. It's a simple task usually. You send in, you see how it works. Um, oh, I forgot to say that of course the code that you send in, the platform automatically evaluates it. So it checks whether you sent in the right code, the right syntax, you got the right results, you handled the edge cases, uh, everything. But the point is that you should first always, however experienced you are or you think you are uh, with coding, you should always try at least the sample test to ex explore the platform itself. But I also recommend just to go to HackerRank or the similar platforms and just get used to this kind of testing method. So but when I failed, I, of course, what my next step was that I spent like two days on platforms like this and I, I did all these uh, coding testing uh, stuff. 
and it's quite fun it's like a crossword or a treasure hunt ad adventure only with coding of course but it, it can be fun but if you get used to it you will perform much better and you will actually you will be able actually showcase your coding skills which is really important at this step uh, so always, always practice before you actually start this because it's even if there are uh, simple questions, you will feel a bit stressed. It will be hard. It will be out of the comfort zone and you can uh, underperform. The take home assignment. I got only two take home assignments, which was, which was lucky looking back at it because it takes a lot of time to solve the take home assignments. So what you if you haven't got take-home assignments uh, ever, you can imagine it like you get a situation like either from the company itself that you are applying for or a random data set and a random situation. I've got this example from the JDS course where actually the last week's test uh, task, the final test task in the course, which I evaluate everyone personally in the, in the JDS course, um, I send out very similar to this take home assignments kind of task to everyone and you will have to solve it. Anyway, I just print screened this from the course and it's like you get a situation, you get a data set with 1 million lines of data or 10 million lines of data and you get a few very broad questions like uh, in this case, in which country should he prioritize his efforts and why nothing else or do you have any advice for Dylan who's running this business so take home assignments practically try to simulate the job that you will do day by day you have to go through data discovery you will have to go through business evaluation you have to clean the data you will have to do everything and and it shows like how complex you can think about data. Uh, tips, a few tips. So I try to spend just as much time with data discovery than with the as with the actual analysis part as well. So the data discovery part can be done quick, but I think that if you are doing it quickly, you won't go deep enough into the data. So for me, for these two tests that I have done, I spent three hours with data discovery. That's, I think that's because I'm a more senior data scientist. Uh, for juniors, it can take eight plus eight hours or six plus six hours, so a bit more. But I spent three hours with data discovery, then three hours with analysis and uh, with creating the presentation. And you will have to showcase your analytic skills which is really complex of course in itself already so you will s y even if they don't ask for it and in one case they didn't ask for it uh, for me i sent in my code because i want to show them that i can code in python or sql or whatever they really appreciated it by the way and the code was very well commented so they could check that what have i done here and there um, they want to check your statistics skills, so probably they will give you a test that involves a, a little bit, at least a little bit statistics, like create. you will have to create a distribution or something like uh, that. And of course, the business skills. So they ask broad questions on purpose. They want to see that you can answer a broad question with a very specific and very useful answer. Anyway, just a quick comment that Sometimes they add hidden gems to the data set. So if you dig really deep, you will find something interesting. But usually the findings, if you have done take home assignments before, the, the findings will be like on the top of the data set. So um, if you find it, you, you find them, you will know that this is what they were looking for. At least that's my experience. You have to showcase your presentation skills too. So spend time with preparing a good presentation, which is, I won't talk about that here, but you know, a good presentation is a presentation that's simple to the point. 
if you want to show a little bit more about how you were thinking, you can always send in backup slides, like slides that are not part of the original presentation, just to show them that you were thinking about this, but it didn't really go anywhere, but you think it's interesting, um, blah, blah, blah. And you can also send in further analysis ideas, like uh, if I had a bigger data set, or if I had a real data set, or if I had a non-anonymized data set, we could have analyzed, or if I had more time for this analysis, we could have analyzed that this is the next step that I would have done. They always like that as well. And if the data set, it's, it's, a, it's a risky move, but if you see that the data set is not clean enough or the description is not clear enough, uh, then dare to ask a smart question. So someone will email you the tasks and you will have that email address to ask questions about the data set if anything's unclear. Uh, but if you do so, make sure that you actually ask smart questions. So if you ans ask questions that are already in the test description, that's not good. That's a red flag for the interviewer. But sometimes they go tricky and they want you to ask questions so they don't give anything and they want to test that at this point how good you are with communication do you dare to ask questions if they see that you can ask smart questions or if you see the missing information on a task then that's a good point so be aware of that but that's the take-home assignment the analytics interview it's usually a half least follow-up on the take-home assignment so at this step, I talked to the analytics teams, two or three people from the team, and we partially talked about my take-home assignment, why did I do what I have done. There was a case where I had to actually present the take-home assignment like it was a presentation and they added questions after that. And the second half of these interviews can be just general discussion about analytics. If it's a more old-fashioned companies, they will ask you uh, stupid test questions like uh, describe the difference between type 1 and type 2 errors, <laughs> things like that. It happens, so at this point you are at the fifth step there is no such a thing as red flag if they prefer to ask these questions then good for them you should have an answer for that but usually more new fashion or I, I think the the companies who really do the job interviews well they will ask they will do a discussion like a more general discussion where you can explain like how do you think about analytics they will talk about your latest projects or or they will give you some cases from the company's life where a statistical analysis didn't work or a coding solution didn't work and they will ask you about that like how do you think about uh, on a high level they won't go into for for me they didn't go into the coding skills because i have already sent in my code and i have already passed the the screening interview so at this point it's more like the thinking process that they are looking for um okay so i i luckily passed the analytics interviews as well I think it's, again, it's question of the communication, but usually it's much easier to talk to analysts for me than to business people. And that shows my the result of my next interview. So the last round, sort of the last round of the interview process could be the PM interviews, uh, product manager or project manager, you will meet the team uh, that you will work with and usually the people who will uh, talk to at this step, they are not data people, they might be data minded people, but they are not data scientists, they don't do coding uh, and stuff like that you will be probably the person who will work with them in a cross-functional team meaning that um, you will work for this PM as an analyst. So it's partially a personality interview. How do you like each other? But also it's like um, you will talk about the working methods and things like that. And for me, specifically when I failed, I did fail uh, 
at this step because I thought that this interview will be just, you know, just a follow-up interview I'm already done, I uh, can't fail at this step and I haven't prepared for it. They, they sent me what, will, will, what should I prepare with or they sent me a few questions what they will ask about but I said that, ah, I'm in already and I actually came home, uh, I did the interview from home and the interview started at 2 p.m. and I arrived home from biking. So I, I, uh, I bicycled before that uh, and I arrived at 1.59 uh, and I was sweating and everything. It was a very, very bad, uh, you know, um, perception about my professionality and everything. Uh, so it was a very bad interview, but it was a bad interview because I didn't take it seriously. So even if this seems like a little chit chat after all, all the harder parts, so take it seriously. If you have hobby projects at this, uh, at this step and if you had hobby projects on your CV, you are in luck because they will ask you about your hobby projects. They, and if you can talk about your hobby projects, it's already in the comfort zone. Uh, what they take it seriously, of course, uh, and arrive early, as I described with my so story. But what you really have to showcase here and what they want to see is that you are really, really data-driven. Even you can be like a data nerd that most of us probably are, so I consider myself a little bit data nerd. You know, I, I enjoy this field and during my everyday life, um, I try to measure many things that others don't. But uh, the point is that you have to showcase this. So it, at this, for, for me, the interview where I failed, it's not just that I didn't take it seriously or I, I was almost late from that interview, but also that I didn't really talk about my data-driven projects. I just talked about general things. So they asked me like how I improved the conversion rate of Data36 and I told them that I talked to a lot of people. I practically talked to all course participants with one-on-ones and that was the truth, but I could have shown another part of the truth that I analyzed almost everything about Data36. So I measured every little step at Data36 when I, uh, anal uh, when I optimized its conversion rates and these two things together that I talked to everyone and I measured everything on the website together brought big conversion increase on Data36. I added a case study about that to Data36, to the Data36 blog if you are interested about this. The point is that I talked more about my qualitative research, which wouldn't have been my job to do, and I forgot to talk about the, da the actual data part. and. The overall impression about me was that I was unprofessional and I'm not that data-minded. So I failed. I think it was a communication error on my side. The point is that take this run seriously and showcase that you are data-driven, even a data nerd. And the last step is the salary negotiation. And I'm not really good with negotiating and salary negotiating. I hate the whole process and I just don't get why uh, uh, an employer cannot just give me the salary that they think that will be great for me. Because if, if they would give me that salary, then I would stay with the company longer, obviously. Anyway, the negotiation is always hard for me specifically, but what can make it much easier if you get data for it. So before you go into the salary negotiation, it can be done via email as well, which can make it more comfortable for some people, for me as well. You can gather data for that. You can ask colleagues, friends, you can reach out to people on LinkedIn that you see that they are in the similar position. If you ask people, like, never ask what is their salary, ask more like relevant people. So ask from a data scientist that what do they think is a good salary range for you for this position. And they will include their experience for that 
anyways. You can check public statistics. For almost every country, someone has done public statistics. It's changed by country to country, so you have to Google it for yourself. There is like more general uh, statistics on glassdoor.com. I think it's more for the United States, but it can be, you know, something you can work with. And if you are moving abroad for a position, always check nambio.com and check the cost of living there because obviously your salary expectations should go up with the cost of living in a given city. So if you know, for instance, that you are living in, let's say, in Hungary and you know the salary range for data scientists in Hungary, but you move to San Francisco and you see that the cost of living there is four times more or five times more, you can just, as a rule of thumb, not like an, an exact number, but at least an estimation, you can just multiply the cost of living difference with the salary range in the country you know. So numbeo.com is really good because it lists the cost of living numbers and it can be really helpful. And don't be like me, there to negotiate. And they say that companies are sort of expecting that you will negotiate. So they will start with a lower salary offer anyway that you could get, which again, I find uh, very bad, but that's, that's only me. Point is, negotiate. Uh, and I think we are... At the last step, so CV round, HR round, coding round, take-home assignment, analytics interview round, PM interview round, and a salary offer or the salary negotiation part. These are the common steps in a, in a data scientist uh, job interview. I hope that I gave you good insights about each step, but feel free to ask questions and I will try to answer each of them. And one closing message or takeaway message from this webinar is that you should always practice. So the job interview process is, as I said at the beginning, is not like that you apply for a position and you will get it instantly. It's an iterative process. You apply, you fail, you try another company, you apply again, you get feedback, you try to improve, you fail, and eventually you will end up with a job but the numbers that I showed you there, I consider myself as a good data scientist. Still, out of 10 CVs, I got only one offer. And those numbers can vary by a lot because of a lot of factors. So practice, 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 and don't give up if you get a few refusals. It's, as I said, it's part of the game. Okay, Q&A session. Uh, I'm not sure which one I should start with because, you know, in five minutes I will open registration to the Junior Data Scientist first month. So quick promo. Uh, uh, the Junior Data Scientist first month is a six-week simulation of being a da data scientist at a startup company, at a true-to-life startup company. And you will work with a huge data set, a true-to-life data set on true-to-life tasks. And at the end of the course, the last week, you will get a take-home assignment as well that I will personally evaluate for everyone who sends it in. So you can also get feedback. If you are interested, data36.com slash JDS, that's the website where you can register. There are only 40 seats in this course because I try to keep it small so I can work with the people closely, I can support everyone and I can be fast with replying emails, replying on Slack and everything. So I try to keep this small. There are only 40 seats available. Uh, feel free to enroll in five minutes. But now it's time for the Q&A session. 